The world is divided into several parts. Middle Earth, which is inhabited by dragons, humans, and many other races. The demonic world, where demons and monsters live. And the spirit world, where the dead live. The spiritual world is a place where souls stay for some time after death. And I was a resident of this spirit world. But here there is no such thing as a resident. I invented it because I'm not going to change. Civilization was just emerging, and I became its first victim in the history of mankind. And it's hard to say who the victim belonged to. Some say heaven. But I know that the gods did not accept this sacrifice. The sacrifice was not even for dragons, because dragons did not contact people at that time. So maybe my death did not even make any sense. It was meaningless. This was the reason why I didn't want to be reborn. I don't want to argue as a human again. But something happened that I didn't expect. She heard loud shouts of, It worked! The experiment was successful! While at the same time she felt something pressing in her chest. Her body felt so heavy. The girl was very surprised that she had a body. She began to look around her body and the place where she was, trying to come to her senses and understand what was happening. People in old clothes began to ask the girl, Is something bothering the doll? There was an awkward pause, which caused a flurry of brown emotions among these people, and they began to shout desperately, Why is she not talking? What have they done wrong? They have invested so much money in this. The girl repeated, Doll? still not understanding what was happening and what these people meant by this word. Everyone is delighted that the girl has spoken. And then, they explain to her that she is now an immortal and powerful doll. The body was created by the workers of the Tower of Magicians who gave their lives to this work. However, since it is impossible to grow a soul, they had to summon a ready-made one and put it into this body, explains one of the magicians, who is dressed in a robe. He continued to talk saying that now the girl could easily destroy even dragons, but only after the experiment with the transfer of abilities was completed. She looked in all directions to look around and give herself a little pause to think. The girl saw cruel pictures of people sitting in a cage, tied with a collar, with many wounds and blood on their bodies. One of the leaders of the magicians began to reassure the girl that she was not human now, and therefore she would not feel pain. He continued to speak, saying that her soul has a possible spiritual power, so she is not afraid of shock, and her body is no less strong, which only made the girl outraged, saying that they want to use her as a guinea pig, to which she was told that she does not even have the opportunity to refuse it. A huge flow of magic manifests around the girl, which surprised and even frightened the magicians, because they hadn't even given her magic yet. So where did it come from? Suddenly, a dragon appeared next to the girl, a huge, beastly dragon with glowing eyes. It shocked everyone, and the girl only made sure that the magicians had not lied. She really had a strong body that could withstand such a huge flow of magic. The chief magician began to order everyone to kill her and the dragon, because they were too dangerous. The girl touched the dragon with her palm, and with a smile on her face ordered it to destroy everyone, thinking to herself that this was the reason why she did not want to be reborn. A very evil and formidable dragon inspires terror in the eyes of each of the magicians. He opened his jaw and began to breathe fire, simply burning everything in its path. Several days have passed since the girl sits in the ruins of the destroyed tower, feeling happy that she has broken the whole tower, but at the same time not understanding what to do next. The girl is in a state of thought. She can go anywhere, but not where. She just doesn't see any possible options, which makes her stupor because of uncertainty. She hates the thought of living among people, and they are unlikely to accept a doll that does not age or get hurt. She sincerely wants to return to the spirit world, but no matter how much you break this doll's body, death cannot be achieved. The spirit world is closed to her. Suddenly the girl notices a creature approaching her and asking if she is a human being. It turns out to be the ruler of the demon kingdom, namely the demon king Cardell, a tall, long-haired guy. The girl suddenly asked, Your grandfather's name was Chester? To which the demon lord only said that this was the name of his great-grandfather and how she knew it. She began to tell me that he boasted a lot about his grandchildren in the spiritual world, and she remembered him well. A strange man who called himself an old man, although he was a milkman. Cardell asks, Who are you? And learns that she is a resident of the spiritual world who was summoned by force, or rather, the subject of research. 
The guy noticed the blobs of magic swirling around the heroine and said that she looked quite strong, to which she added that she was so strong that she couldn't even die. She wants to die, but she can't. Her body is too strong. Cardell changed the subject, saying that he had a son and he would like to see the girl as his butler, to which she immediately refused. After which the demon lord continued to speak, he said that demons are born with one of three powers, absorption, seduction, and destruction. His son just has destruction. No one among the previous kings had such power. The girl thought that he was just bragging about his child, but suddenly she heard the cherished words, the son of the demon lord, when he becomes the king of demons, will be able to give her the death she so desperately wants, but on condition that she will be his butler. The girl began to object. She had lived in the spirit world for too long and did not know what butlers do and did not understand the documentation, to which she received an answer that an assistant would help her with the documents, and her task was only one, to protect the son of the bishop and keep discipline in the castle. She decided to agree without hesitation, because all she wants now is to return to the world of spirits. The girl found out that her son's name is Julian, and she really likes this name, but suddenly, the power of magic, most likely the magic of displacement, and the girl found herself in a demonic castle. Now she is the butler, Juliana. The girl was asked about her race, and she replied that she was a doll, just a doll, and that's how she was recorded. After that, they asked her name, which drove the girl into a kind of stupor and embarrassment, because she has no name. It has been many years since she forgot her human name, and as a result, she was asked to go to Mr. Julian. It is forbidden to talk about awakening in the presence of a young gentleman, because the next stage has not been 200 years. He could not become an adult, says the guy with glasses. All demons go through awakening three times. The first occurs in childhood. The transition to a child, the second leads to adulthood, and the third improves physical abilities. Usually these stages take 100 years, but with the powers of demons, it can be delayed. The boy says that it is important to memorize the names of the main servant and the maid servant, brother and sister Leon and Leo. They should be well controlled. He should be addressed as young master. Now he is five years old. He has a nanny, but still needs to be close to him. A butler girl met a young boy and bowed to him. The guy with the glasses had to leave the two of them, as he had a lot of work to do. It was too fast and therefore unexpected for the butler. Juliana's butler began to think about how she should behave with the child. She had been watching the child before, making sure he didn't cry, and then she noticed a leaf in his hair and reached out to pick it up. The boy reacted very aggressively, biting her hand like a dog, and when she took him away from her hand, he told her not to touch him. The young gentleman said to let him go. The butler let him go. Only he fell from the height of her hand. The boy began to shout that he could have been treated more gently, and the butler, as he asked, took him in her arms and gently put him on the ground, which caused even more displeasure of the master. The butler touched the cheeks of the sweet boy and began to squeeze him. He became even more angry and began to scream at the top of his voice, and a powerful field formed around him. The boy tore off the girl's head. He began to resent why she had not died yet, to which the butler replied that she was a doll and could not die, after which she took him in a tight embrace, calling him a good boy. The girl remembers that the Lord can cut off her head, but it is so hard to resist the temptation to squeeze his cheeks. Suddenly, the servants come running in from behind and start shouting in astonishment who this girl is and how dare she raise her head in front of the young master. The boy tells her that the girl is his butler, to which the girl, who turned out to be a nanny, only became more worried and began to ask who invited her here and why she was hearing about it for the first time. The nanny began to call for security, and a real commotion began. Everyone surrounded the butler, wanting to attack her. The butler remembered that her duties also included restoring order in the castle, so she began to use her abilities for this purpose, thus frightening the demons. Everyone was stopped by a guy with glasses. He said that the butler controls the people inside the castle. He explained to the nanny that they now had a butler, Juliana, and that it was this girl, and began to beg the butler not to use his monsters on the knights. The guy with the glasses decided to leave, saying that he needed to warn the others about the new butler as soon as possible, so that there would be no more such incidents. The nanny came to her senses and began to apologize to the butler, 
to which the latter only bowed politely, showing that everything was fine. The boy began to look at the monsters summoned by his butler. He wondered if the girl was a necromancer, to which she said that she was not, because they were not corpses. The butler let the boy touch these creatures. He felt how cold they were. The girl explained that they were Tokebi, and the boy was delighted with these cute monsters. The butler could not resist and reached out to stroke the dear gentleman, but the nanny intervened. She began to insist that it was time to go to the castle, as it was time for a nap. But the boy told her to let go of the butler's hand, to which she could not resist the young Julian's words, and let go of the girl. And then, Juliana's butler could not stand it and took the young boy's cheeks again, which made him even angrier. The young gentleman was so angry that he cut off the butler's hand. The girl put the hand back on, but it stood up crookedly, so she had to ask to have her hand cut off again. Two weeks have passed, and during this time the butler has even managed to reduce the gentleman's anger attacks from five times a day to one or two. The boy asks the girl for her name, and when she replies that she doesn't have one, he begins to think that she is lying, which makes the young gentleman even angrier. The boy asked if even Henry hadn't given her a name, and was told that the demon lord was not the girl's father, so why would he give her a name? And then the boy asked what happened to her parents, and learned that they had been there a long time ago, but now they were gone. The young gentleman asks if he can give her a name, to which he receives a positive answer. He compares her eyes to a peridot, so he settled on Perry. He continues to talk about how her eyes are light green, just like a gem, and the girl replies that she hasn't seen herself in the mirror, so the gentleman decided to take her with him. The boy took her by the hand and began to lead her at a brisk pace, constantly urging her on. The young gentleman took her to his room and took out the gems, put a bracelet on her hand, and asked her to look in the mirror, for which he interrupted his lunch. The girl went to the mirror and began to look at herself, examining her hair, skin, eyes, and agreed that she and the peridot were like two peas in a pod. The young gentleman looked back modestly and said, Take it! To which the young girl replied, I don't need it. And the boy was very angry at this answer. He was not used to taking no for an answer, and he furiously said, If they give you something, take it. The girl finally agreed and the gentleman said, You can give it to someone else if you don't like it. Perry asked, Shall I return it to you? Do you want it back? And she started to take off the bracelet. No, don't take it off. The guy released his magical energy, cutting off the girl's arm. The magical power made the walls tremble, and the tiles that seemed to be made for centuries cracked. But the girl did not feel a hint of emotion. The girl said that it was quite troublesome to deal with the consequences of her master's aggression, and the boy asked if she would obey him if he just talked. Perry said without hesitation that she would obey him. Then why don't you obey me when I tell you not to touch me? asked the young gentleman. The white-haired girl smiled and said gently, Because the young gentleman is very nice. The boy replied that everyone around him said he was ugly, but the girl was adamant. She said it was impossible, because it was the first time she had seen such a cute child. This confused the young gentleman, who rarely heard such kind words from anyone, and he wondered what was so good about it, to which the girl said that he was so sweet that she wanted to always be with him and always protect him. So what? Sooner or later everyone will die, said the young man. I'm not going to die, the girl said, making the boy startle. No matter what my lord does, I will not die. The girl took the boy's cheek with a gentle hand, looking into his eyes with her pure eyes. Then Perry will always be around, the young man asked again. Of course, she replied firmly. If it's a lie, the boy began. If it's a lie, you should know that I will kill you. He is giving me a way to die? If I disappear after he becomes king, will he come to kill me? The girl thought, looking at the boy serenely and replied, As you wish. Young sir, the girl began to call out to the boy for a moment of silence. Deciding to break this long silence, she asked, Did you wet yourself? No, the young gentleman said furiously, and the girl gently asked him if he had littered, which made the boy even more angry and exclaimed, do you take me for a child? To which the girl calmly replied that he was a child. The girl went to the door and met the nanny, who told her that breakfast with the demon king was ready, and Julian was still sleeping. 
Perry immediately realized what to do. She went to the crib, picked up the boy and threw him in the air, grabbed him in flight. The boy said that she was stupid, and the girl just said that her name was Perry, because he had given her that name, which made Julian even more angry. He started shouting that he had no memory problems. The nanny brought water for washing and Perry used it to wash the boy, but he started screaming that he hated her. Perry thought that if this kid can get angry so often, it's not far from fainting due to high blood pressure. So she asked him to raise his voice no more than five times a day. But the boy accepted this as a condition for him. The nanny began to ask the young gentleman to get ready quickly. As everything was ready, he got up and began to button his shirt. Perry decided to help him, for which she struggled with her hands. But even with her hands cut off, she buttoned the buttons and prepared the boy for breakfast. The girl asked the gentleman to go through the awakening stage faster so that she would not have to do this anymore, which caused a wave of emotions in the nanny because it is forbidden to talk about it. The boy was upset that if he passed the awakening, Perry would not touch him. Perry noticed that the nanny even cried. The nanny would never have thought that this day would come. She is just delighted because the young man has opened his heart to someone. She is already his seventh nanny. The young gentleman doesn't like it when demons touch each other first and then him, to which Perry said that she was not a demon. The nanny wondered if she was human, but learned that the doll. The boy used lightning magic on Perry to see if she would die, and the result was the same. The girl was tired of explaining to him that she would not die. She still asked him not to ruin her clothes. Lately, Julian hadn't rejected her touch, but he attacked her whenever he had a chance. And every time she didn't die, he said it was strange, and she was just reminding him that she was a doll. Perry asked Julian to sit down on a chair, after which she began to comb his hair and give him a stylish hairstyle. Later, the nanny came up to them and sincerely thanked the butler, saying that with her appearance, she could now breathe a sigh of relief. The girl took the young gentleman in her arms, carrying him in a shameful pose for a boy. She asked if she should let him go, to which he recalled a moment from the recent past when she was already very painfully letting him down to the ground, and he fell and began to shout at her, let her just dare. The nanny said that it was wrong to carry a child like that and pointed to a nearby boy as a way to carry a boy. Perry took the young gentleman as the nanny showed her. It may look ridiculous, but it's right. The only thing is that now two hands are busy, and it's not very convenient. The nanny clarified that Julian should not be held the way Perry did, especially in front of his friends, which surprised the girl. She asked how his friends had not become corpses yet. The boy said that he had friends, but to tell the truth, he did not like them. Later, it turned out that they were not interesting or interesting to spend time with, and they never helped Julian. The only thing he did was help them, after which they began to call him different. The butler replied that this is called a stupid idiot because he is a fool who gives others everything and gets nothing in return. The boy became angry after her words, but then the nanny began to calm him down, saying that she had never seen a boy smarter than him, and of course she was lying. Young Julian is eating the most varied and delicious food in the company of Perry, when suddenly the nanny noticed him and began to grumble that he should not eat with his hands. The girl gave Julian a taste of broccoli, which made him cringe and shouted indignantly, Do you want to die? Throwing the broccoli on the floor, Perry asked the young gentleman, Do you want to become an idiot? To which he looked at her in confusion, and she explained that if he refused to eat everything, his health and mind would deteriorate greatly. He turned around, looked at the broccoli and said that Perry was lying, and how can health and mind be connected? And the girl replied that the brain is also bad when we are bad. The nanny supported this dialogue by saying that now that the young gentleman had thrown the broccoli on the floor, he was on the path of stupidity, and the boy immediately shouted out to get the broccoli immediately. Julian began to eat broccoli and listened to the butler say that today he was smarter, and tomorrow he would be the same, if he ate everything he was given, and not selectively. The young gentleman said that he would eat broccoli tomorrow, after which Perry said that it was a good choice, and patted him on the head which made the boy angry. He went to write a letter. The boy began to write a letter, wrote in it, I'll kill you, continued writing, asked Perry what it was called when the legs and arms are separate and received the answer, wrote down, tear off the limbs. The nanny saw the letter 
and began to say that she would not allow him to use such words. She heard that the boy wanted to send a letter to Leo and began to exclaim that friends should not send such things, to which Julian only denied because he was not his friend. Perry looked at the letter and expressed her opinion on how to write threats to the fake friend, which angered the nanny even more. In the end, Perry did tell the young gentleman how to write a letter, helped to correct some mistakes, which made the nanny desperate. She told Perry that Mr. Leff was the son of a duke and that he had to stop Julian because he was now provoking a conflict. Perry asks if Mr. Leff is awake, to which Julian replies, he was fully awake 100 years ago, he's an adult now. The nanny is very concerned that the duke's son might want to kill the young gentleman. To her worries, Perry suggests killing the duke's son first. The nanny replies that Perry seems to have a poor understanding of the structure of the demon world. The position of king is not inherited, and if a stronger demon is found and kills the current king, he will take his throne, which is the reason why the young gentleman who has not yet awakened has become the target of high-ranking demons. They want to get rid of him while he is still weak. Therefore, says the nanny, it is natural that Henry protects his son and even provided him with such a strong butler. But now the duke can attack, only if he has time to catch up with the letter and... The boy called Perry, and she sat down next to him and said that she would always be there for him. Julian says that he is very strong and ready to tear Mr. Leff apart, but he will let the butler help him. At that time, the demon lord looked at the letter that his son wrote. Because he had not written letters for a long time, he obviously did not expect that the letter would be threatening. One of the servants said that Perry helped the boy write the letter, but the Lord decided to send it as it was without changing anything. This can be an excuse for the Duke to act. Worried in the castle, the Lord of Devils only refuses, saying that a small fight between children can help him get stronger. The Bishop began to think about which country of people is moderately dangerous. The Kingdom of Sodan. They say they have developed skills to counter demons, they have strong armies, and their borders are in contact with the world of demons. The demon lord ordered his subordinate to start a war with them, but since troops will not be sent without a necessary reason, it is necessary to make sure that the kingdom starts the war first. Since they are good at fighting demons, the bishop assumes that they have a poison. He ordered to get it. It is enough to spread it on the duke's lands and can destroy about a third of the population. The nanny shows Perry a list of games that Julian can play, such as hide and seek, or the same catch-up, but it's more like a nanny's wish list. She is very interested to see the face of a cheerful Julian. The first on the wish list was the game Twist and Turn. A girl picked up a young gentleman and began to spin him from side to side so that the boy almost threw up. The nanny began to shout at the girl what she was doing and then explain to her what she should do. Perry remembered that she had done this before. When she picked the boy up from the bed, she took Julian in her arms and threw him high and picked him up catching more indignation from the nanny. The nanny suggested that the two of them play catch-up and said that either Julian would agree to treat him to chocolate cookies, which she used to bribe him with. Perry is driving, but here's the bad luck. She immediately caught the boy. As soon as the game started, Yana again had to explain everything to her, that you need to adapt to the pace of the child. But games for children were too boring for the doll. The babysitter offers the last option hide-and-seek. The results of the game of rock-paper-scissors decided that Julian is now driving. He counted to 50 and very quickly found his nanny, who was not hiding so well, and together they began to search for Perry. Perry was found in the bones, but the nanny fainted from the disgust. The nanny scolded the butler severely when she woke up, and also gave her books on parenting and general information that a girl needs to know about demons. Young Julian has trouble falling asleep. So the butler offers to sing him a lullaby, but the boy suddenly declares that he wants to sleep now, and after a couple of minutes, the girl hears his steady breathing and complete silence. Perry decided to read the parenting literature her nanny had given her. When the young gentleman suddenly wakes up and says he doesn't want to sleep anymore, the girl offers to read him a book. Her eyes fell on a book with the title, The Adventure of a Princess and a Night That Begins Every Night, and she was intrigued by it, opened it, and started reading. It's a story about a beautiful princess who was abused by the prince who loved her. Late at night, the knight entered the room where the princess was sleeping, kissed her, and then... 
Perry realized that the book was clearly not intended for a child and suddenly stopped reading, saying that she respected the Lord after he woke up. Perry approached her nanny with indignation, asking why she had given her such a beautiful novel. She replied that if she wanted to know demons better, she should know this, and it was a best-selling book in the demon world. The boy noticed the book out of the corner of his eye and told me that Perry had read it to him yesterday, but suddenly stopped. After these words, the nanny was numb, but a minute later she took the books from Perry, as she had asked. Perry lifted the boy out of bed, as it was time for him to get up. It seems that he even got used to her throwing him and catching him in her arms. He is no longer irritated. The boy suddenly asks what he needs to do to become an adult, to which Perry replied that she did not know. The boy objected, How do you not know? You are an adult yourself. The girl thought that she died as a human in childhood, and in the world of spirits there is no age. She lives as a doll for only two months. She thought carefully and replied, No, sir, I am only two months old. It turns out that Perry is even less of a gentleman, but why didn't she want to read him that book? The boy asks this question. Perry only answers that even when he becomes an adult, he won't want a girl to read him such a book. A boy is sad because all his friends have grown up and do not come to play with him because they are ashamed of him. Perry reassures him by saying, Mr., you don't need to be ashamed of being a child, they are just not real friends, the boy asks, trying to understand this question, are friends not real? To which the girl confirms and says that such friends disappear in difficult moments, just like now. The boy is very worried that he has no friends, and how Councilman Perry tells him that he needs to be a little kinder, not to kill for no reason, and then he will have friends. The boy cites Leff as an example, saying that he has friends, Perry's answer is that he has a good side, after which the young gentleman asks the following question. What good sides does he have? The girl immediately thought about how cute Julian is. The young gentleman asks the nanny where Perry is, to which the nanny replies that she has been called by Henry's butler. The nanny says that today she will stay with him and entertain him, but the boy says that this is not necessary. Suddenly the boy asks his nanny if he is cute, and he gets this answer, of course, young sir, you are very strong and cute. And he asks a counter question, even if I cut off your head? This shocked the nanny. The boy thinks Perry is strange. The first time they met, they didn't even talk properly. And he tore her head off, screamed, threw anger at her, tore her arms and legs. But she was calm and treated it as a small nuisance. The young gentleman asks the nanny to tell him more about Perry. The nanny starts lying about not knowing anything. The child notices her lies and threatens her. The nanny gets very scared and decides to give him all the information. The nanny says, Butler, she's a doll, created by magicians. She's different, though I don't know why. And she came here after signing some kind of contract with the demon king. After that, the nanny asked if the young gentleman suspected her of anything, to which he gave a negative answer. The boy does not know when she will leave him, but he definitely does not want it but sometimes he notices such an empty look in Perea's eyes, as if she is ready to leave at any moment. Julian would like to help her instead of Cardell. Maybe then she will stay with him. He thought that if she liked him to be nice, then he would be nice. And if she said to start by being kind, then he would start with that, and at the same time ask the nurse not to tell the butler about today's. Perry came into the room, but as soon as she saw the smiling and sweet Julian, she immediately got goosebumps. It was an incredibly sweet sight, albeit strange. She decided that the boy was sick and poetically took him in her arms and took him to Henry. The sweet and joyful Julian shocked Henry into going out the door to call the demons while a killer bursts into the office. The demon lord came into the room and saw the killers and the traces of the battle. He looked at them carefully and said that they were still very green killers. He found poison in one of them and ordered to put all the survivors in the dungeon and get rid of the dead. The boy asks Perry to hug him, but she replies that she is dirty and may have poison on her. But Julian says that he is not in danger. He jumps into her arms for a big hug. The king and his servants say that maybe the boy just doesn't have a mother. But Julian only replies that Perry is not his mother, and after a short pause he tells everyone that she is his. But Perry replies that she belongs only to herself. Cardell told the boy that he shouldn't be offended, since she was his butler, so she already belonged to him, which really pissed the girl off, since it was so easy to decide everything for her. 
A guy with glasses takes Perry to the killers to question them, which is on her list of duties, since they attacked and tried to kill a young gentleman. The girl was warned that she should wear a mask, but because of the doll's body, she does not care about the smell or the sight of blood. Henry's butler takes the girl to the prisoners and asks her to try out her torture skills on them. Perry asks the boy if he believes in the existence of souls, after which she uses magic to summon the right spirits and directs them to the prisoners. They scream and beg for mercy, although these are the souls of people who died at their hands. Perry promises the prisoners that they will not be able to die today. She will make them regret attacking Mr. Julian. The young gentleman wakes up and sees Perry coming in. He immediately finds out where she was. It turns out that she was in a dungeon to punish the bad guys. The girl tells Julian that he can change himself and go to breakfast, and she will go to change, to which he does not agree, saying that he will wait until Perry changes. The girl is enjoying a moment of solitude, immersed in her thoughts. She realizes that she shouldn't get close to Julian because she will go to the spirit world when he grows up, when suddenly a blonde man took her by the shoulder, saying that he had wanted to meet the butler for a long time. The guy said he knew her and would like to call her by name, began to ask her about her feelings around him, or maybe she was after girls. A beautiful girl approaches her, saying that she is ready to give her pleasure in her favorite way. She did not hesitate to confess her sympathy for Perry. The girl unceremoniously took both of them by the neck and lifted them above the floor, began to strangle them when Henry suddenly entered the room and asked them to let go of the two demons. The girl asks him who these two are, to which Henry replies that these are the maid and servant he mentioned earlier. Leah and Leon. Their main occupation is to deal with invaders, but the question remains where they were when the assassins invaded the castle. Henry's butler recognized that what these two were doing now was much more important. Leah began to praise Perry's butler, how wonderful she was. But Leon was going to try new food. Perry took the letter and realized that it was from Duke Zerk, the girl asks. Then this Duke is targeting the young master? Although she realizes that he does not have time for this now, as his people are dying. This letter looks more like the Duke is trying to intimidate the young lord because he can't kill him. Leff doesn't even have the courage to challenge him directly, so he does ratty things, hiring assassins to strike from behind. From that moment on, Leo and Leon are responsible for the young gentleman's security. Perry appoints them, asking Henry for permission, who says he doesn't care, and that as long as Perry is around, they are not needed. Perry brought these two to Julian, saying that now they would go with us. The boy was only angry and said, let them disappear from his sight now. The girl asks if Julian is hungry, to which he replies that he is not, but is immediately interrupted by the nanny, saying that he is lying and that she could hear his stomach rumbling very clearly, making the young gentleman embarrassed. Perry says that it would be a good idea to write another letter before eating, as it turned out that the assassins were sent by Duke Leff. Julian finished the letter, and it would seem that it would be necessary to hide the fact that the young man was attacked but Perry decided that it would be right to write a letter. Let him guess what was happening. Perry thought that all demons go through an awakening, these three stages. And since Julian has not yet reached the second stage, it means that great power is concentrated in him. But now he is in great danger. And as far as he is concerned, most likely Cardell's powers are very great. Perry asked the nanny to wait here and then tell Henry everything. And in the meantime, they would send a letter. The butler asked the boy to promise her that he would not use magical energy until she told him to, even if they were on the verge of death because he trusted her. The girl and Leo approached Leo, who was already waiting for them, and handed him the box. He thought it was a gift for him, but it was for Leo. Perry just let him hold it. After that, the girl asked Leia to hide in the shadow of the young gentleman and go with them on the road. The son of the demon king was taken to Lef, who, when he saw him, asked the purpose of his visit and laughed because he was still a child, asking, who is next to you, a nurse? The boy was about to get angry when Perry took him by the shoulder and reminded him of what she had asked him earlier, after which she said without negative emotions that she was his butler. This made Mr. Leff smile, and he began to laugh at the fact that the butler was dragging him around, a demon who had not even passed the second stage of awakening because he was a burden and the demon king cared so much about him. After that, he changed the subject, saying, 
So you wrote that something bad happened. And in response, he heard from Perry that the boy had been attacked and the customer could not be found. So the young gentleman came here to ask for help from an old friend. Leff was surprised that Julian was calling him an old friend. He thought it couldn't be after the boy had threatened to tear off his limbs. But then his eyes fell on Leon and he asked who the blonde man with the box was. The blonde replied that he was the chief servant, which made the leaf laugh even more since they had come here completely unguarded. Perry added that they had brought a gift for Mr. Leaf, as it seems he was offended by the previous letter, to which he laughed again, saying they wanted to bribe him with a gift to make him forget everything. Perry only said that the gift might soon go bad, and he should wear it as soon as possible. She would definitely like Mr. Leaf. Leff opened his gift. He had no idea what those black balls were. Perry replied that they were just part of the gifts they had sent the other day to the son of the Demon King. And by the way, more than half of them had been used. Leff was very angry. He threw the box on the floor and ordered the guards to grab the three. Perry asked Leon to lock the door and he did, so now the guards can't get in. Perry gave the boy a jar to drink the mixture inside and then allowed him to kill as many people as he wanted. Perry found an interesting potion in the laboratory. Henry suggested that this special potion is a condensation of demonic energy and absorption power. It is used by higher demons for freedom of power. Julian drank this potion and began to smash all the demons on his way. He killed them all, but left Lef, tied him up and told him to take him with him. They took the bodice and went home. Perry said, It's a pity the Duke himself wasn't there so Julian could have woken up. Leo expressed concern that they would have been destroyed in a second, to which she received a response from Perry that this was hardly possible, since she was with them. They came to the castle, and the first person who met them was Henry. He was just shocked by what was happening. He began to shout that they had gone crazy, and when he saw the blood on Julian's face, he began to call for a doctor. But the boy interrupted him, saying that he was not wounded. It was the blood of his enemies. He had killed them all. They showed Henry the trophy of the bound Leff. Perry says that the potion was very useful and was very useful in the battle, which shocked Henry. He says that if there are side effects, instead of demonic power, only the power of absorption may remain. Perry just refuses, saying the boy is strong. There will be no problems with this. Henry began to teach Julian that he could not drink everything he was given, to which he replied that Perry had given him the potion, which meant it was safe to drink which shows his great degree of trust in Perry. He added that he used a suppression stone on Leff and let him be imprisoned, after he said that Leon took Leff and carried him away. Henry asked what they were doing in the Duke's castle to know what the consequences might be, to which Perry replied, Nothing special, just the power of all the demons in the castle was absorbed by the young lord. When suddenly the boy started coughing, everyone paid attention and saw the boy falling and losing consciousness. Perry took Julian in her arms. She was all very worried about him and called the boy to wake up, when suddenly a very great magic was felt, and Henry intercepted the boy and threw him into the lake. The lake of awakening it began. A week has passed since Julian's awakening began. The butler is very worried about him. The nanny tries to reassure her, saying that all demons go through the stage of awakening in the lake. She also went through it, to be more precise. Demons with the power of absorption go through this stage in the Blue Lake. Demons with the power of seduction in pink and with the power of destruction already in black. Perry continues to think. She is sure that the nanny is right, but she is worried that she has made a lot of mistakes in relation to Julian. The nanny interrupts her thoughts by inviting the girl to the table. There are various dishes on the table, including meat pie, turkey, broccoli stew. Broccoli? This brings back memories for Perry. She recalls how she persuaded a young man to eat broccoli while not eating it herself, claiming that she was a doll and did not need it. But he persuaded her to eat it, and she chewed it a little and spat it out, saying it was disgusting. The boy says that means she will be a failure, and Perry says that this does not apply to adults, but he will have to eat broccoli even after waking up. The girl feeds Julian broccoli, and when he obediently eats it, she praises the boy, and says that she will ask the cook to prepare his favorite dessert. But the boy only replies that instead of dessert, he would like to eat main dishes and desserts with Perry. Perry began to worry that the adult Julian might forget her, so she decided to clarify this issue with the nanny. She said that of course not, the memories remain, 
after which Perry decided to find out how tall he would grow and received an answer from the nanny. Well, if you look at his father, he is tall. If you measure by the age of adults, he is 23, 24 years old, Perry thought. From that age, people are considered adults, and some already have mustaches. Hmm, Julian with a lush mustache. Suddenly, she remembered the day when Julian smiled brightly for the first time. If she had known it would happen, she would have called the artist anyway. Whatever Henry said, she should have painted those little fidgety fingers. The nanny asked if Perry was sure he didn't want to eat, and she just looked at the broccoli stew and said that it was disgusting anyway. Leon joins them and sees a pile of books that Leah most likely brought. She always chooses books like this. He turned to Perry and said, By the way, butler, I was forbidden to enter the underground prison. I just pulled energy from left from time to time and Henry made a big fuss. Perry asked him why he would eat a man's energy, and he just said that food is food and joked about Perry asking if she wanted to share her energy. But she was only more annoyed. Leon assumed that the girl was only kind to the young gentleman, which made her think about him again and worry about him again. He tries to reassure the girl, pointing out that everyone goes through this stage, and it is so long because the gentleman has great strength. But the girl is still anxious. She worries that if something goes wrong, suddenly he won't be able to get out of the lake. Suddenly he will regret the time spent with her or notice her flaws. Suddenly he won't hug her anymore. This bitterness is caused by the love that the girl realized too late. The knights are preparing to shoot their spears as soon as they see the young lord, but then they suddenly notice blue lights. Perry stands in front of them and asks what they are going to do to her lord. The main knight thought that she was not dangerous, since she did not even emit demonic energy and ordered to kill her when she grabbed him by the neck. Just a couple of moments later she killed everyone, leaving only one to go and tell his master everything. He was very frightened. He saw his own partners dead, looked up at Perry and asked who she was, hearing only one word in response. Butler. Vadal Castle. The surviving knight approaches the Lord and tells him everything that happened, showing him the ring that fell from the finger of their commander. The Lord is very angry that they could neither kill the child nor kill the unarmed girl, who is just a butler. The master realized that since the rookie knight was released, it means it was a warning, and if this butler and Julian were in the duke's castle, then they were really too strong to kill so many demons. More information is needed about this butler, who she is. Where is the age? It is best to lure a strong demon to your side. The lord ordered the knight to tell everything he knew. He said, It was a girl. Her hair was white or golden. It was hard to see in the dark. Her eyes were light green, and her name was Perry. There were blue lights around her that changed their appearance. I have not yet felt demonic energy. So she's not a demon, just a simple human. Who could be stronger than the commander of the knights, a dragon? No, but what if Cardell bent over backwards and got a dragon on his side? He's just crazy. The Lord ordered the knight to send out invitations to a meeting to all the demon dukes and to learn more about this butler when asked what the Lord was going to do. He only reminded that demons and dragons signed an agreement not to invade each other's territory, and if the dragon was here, it could help to overthrow the demon king. Perry tells Leon that there was an attack tonight, and she was able to kill them all. But she is still worried that he is not able to defend himself in the lake. Leon explains that there is an unspoken rule that you cannot touch the young master while he is in the Lake of Awakening. Perry asks Leia and the nanny to stay away because her lights want to kill demons. Leon was about to joke that since it was created by humans, it was created from the point of view of aesthetics. But his joke is interrupted by Perry, who grabs him by the neck, when suddenly, suddenly, Julian emerges from the lake, an adult Julian, the same black hair that absorbs sunlight, eyes the color of sunset, horns that have grown to the size of Perry's palm, a head taller than her. Julian walked closer to Perry and hugged her tightly, as if to thank her for everything she does for him. And then he turned his attention to Leon and asked what they were doing here. Perry slapped Leon on the back of the head, showing that he was guilty. Julian turns his attention to the intruders, who are being watched by the Takabi light. A large stream of demonic energy appears around Julian. He lifts one of the intruders into the air and says, the next demon King Julian has completed his awakening. Pass this on to your master. 
Julian asks Leon to remove the corpses. He looks at the boy menacingly, forcing him to obey his demands. Perry asks why he did this, because she has more strength than Leon, to which he receives the following answer. I hate it when Perry touches other guys, because Perry is mine. Perry is happy that the gentleman hasn't changed much. She puts her hand on his hair to stroke it, but also warns Julian not to behave like that in front of the future queen, because he will need to go on a journey to find his mate. But he just refuses, saying that he only needs Perry and likes only her. Julian thinks it's different from love. What he's always liked about Perry is that she's always been there for him. She's come close to him when no one else has. She's broken through that hard wall that no one else has gone through before, so... Does it matter if it's a crush or an addiction? What really matters is if I can love Perry. Julian turns to his father and asks him what love is, and adds that the feeling you have for your partner is a kind of parental love, and is different from sympathy. Henry says, Mr. You like Perry. What is this feeling? Julian replies, I want her to always be around because she is mine. And in response gets, Son, you need to learn to distinguish between affection and obsession. The Demon King continued to speak, asking if Julian knew why she was here in the first place, and then said that the girl wanted to die, which shocked Julian. The King continued, The doll you are obsessed with has come to die by your hand. She wants her body destroyed by you because you have the most destructive power in the history of demons. And in general, I offered her this myself. What do you think? Are you ready to give her such freedom? Julian replies that he won't and leaves. He doesn't want to, because Perry is completely his. He goes out and meets Perry at the entrance. The girl asks how everything went, reflects in her mind and tells herself that she will wait a little longer until the third awakening and then leave. Henry comes up to them and says that Perry and Leon have been assigned to accompany Julian on the trip, and they have also been asked to keep it in moderation. But Julian is only annoyed that Leon will be with them. Perry wanted to go to Leon to tell him that he needs to get ready, but this pissed Julian off, so she decided to give this role to Henry and go to the nanny, but the guy says that it's unnecessary and calls her after him. Julian takes the girl by the hand and leads her to the castle, asks her what she likes, and she only answers that she doesn't like broccoli. And Julian says that he wants to fill the castle with what she likes, so she won't want to leave. She only answers that she wasn't going to leave. Julian says she's lying, and Perry just asks if she's ever lied to him, to which she answers yes, and then Julian asks her to promise him that she won't leave him. A guy takes a girl's hand and gently bites her finger. The Demon King wonders why they are digging under Pry, why they are so interested in the doll, asks Henry to find out, after which Henry asks him if it is worth taking Perry on a trip when all the attention is focused on her, and given Julian's attitude towards her, it could be dangerous and prevent him from finding a life partner but Cardell only says that his son will be able to cope with everything. Julian asks Perry to swear with her soul that she will never leave him and gives her a finger to swear. But the girl just said she didn't want it, tied his finger with a bandage, making Julian feel even worse than he thought it would be. Perry says she's willing to swear by something other than her soul, but Julian says nothing, but her soul is good enough. The luggage and money for the trip have already been brought, and Perry is packing everything, marveling at the scale, because for this money, you can live for five years without needs. But Julian still wants to take an oath, but he agreed to postpone it. Julian was going to visit an old friend. He and Perry approached the cage with Lef, heard him screaming to be released, and that his father would not just leave him like that. After which Julian said that all his father had left was a title. He was not capable of anything else. And he threatened, Lef, if you look at Perry again, I'll tear out your eyes. But Lef looked, and he paid for it. Julian hit him painfully, leaving a large scar on his body. When asked why he came here, Julian replied that he just did. He liked the situation that no one knew where Lef was. He looked at Perry and asked her to ask permission for the demon of nightmares to come here from now on, because it would be a shame to let a good snack die like that. Mr. Cardell ordered Henry and Chuck to spread a rumor worse than the one about using nightmare demons. Namely, a rumor that Lef was dying, so that the Duke would come to them soon, and he also gave them the task of keeping Julian at the manor as long as possible and allowed them to use the doll for this purpose. Henry asks the king to drink less, otherwise he might get sick, but he only refuses, saying that today the memories of Julia are especially strong. 
Perry goes to Julian's room to wake him up. On the way, she thinks how to wake the guy up now, throw him in the air. But now he is twice as big as before. But when she opens the door, she notices that Julian is already awake, and next to her is a nanny who is going through the wardrobe. The son of the demon king asked the girl to wash him. She took a towel and began to wash him, and heard from the boy that now he was not in pain, as he was in childhood when she washed him. Julian asks the girl to ask to serve breakfast, since it is very noisy outside and apparently everyone is preparing for a banquet. He would prefer to pretend not to notice him. The demon king made a toast in honor of his son and allowed everyone to eat and drink as much as they wanted to Julian. The nanny offered Perry something to eat, but she refused, when suddenly Perry approached the girl from behind and told her to eat, but she tried it anyway and found it really tasty. Julian drinks a glass of wine, after which one of the guests offers him another drink because he is an adult, after which a whole crowd of demons appears. Wanting to pour him wine, Henry asks the doll to make sure that he does not drink too much. After that, everyone turned their attention to Perry and began offering her a drink, and she did something no one expected. She picked up a barrel and began drinking wine from it, drinking the whole barrel. Julian asks Perry if she's okay. He knows she's a doll, but he still cares about her. The girl says that since Julian is so drunk, he needs to get some air. After a few seconds, Julian asks, My father said I was obsessed with you. Is that bad? To which the girl replied, Of course, he continued, saying that his father was also obsessed with his mother, but there was no awkwardness, because she is strong, but Perry is also strong. Julian refuses his father. He does not want to stay in the castle, but Cordell says that a gift has been prepared for him, and it is too precious for his son to miss it. Literally seconds later, the king is told that the gift has already arrived and asked to go Perry to help deliver the gift. Perry asks the assistant if the gift is alive. He gets the answer, yes. Perry notices a demon sneaking up on them, takes him by the hair and lets him go. He scared her with his suddenness. The assistant said to Duke Zerk, welcome Duke. But he openly did not like Perry's behavior and asked how she could address him like that because he is a great duke and she replied that she did not know he was a duke. The assistant said that King Cardell was waiting for the duke, and the latter only asked if his son was being tortured here and received a positive answer. He wanted to kill the king. The duke was brought to the king. Julian asks why he is his gift. He does not need the duke at all, but he suddenly starts a fight, and the doll got in the way. She protected Julian with her body, receiving a small scratch on the neck, which quickly healed and the duke was thrown to the floor. Julian said in an irritated and angry voice that he would show the duke his son, and he could only follow him in silence. A young gentleman drinks a jar of potion, and his father looks at his son and says that he looks very much like Julia. The duke runs up to his son and examines him. He hears Julian talking next to him. No one would lock him up here without him doing something wrong. The duke asks what Lef is guilty of, and is told that his son wanted to kill the son of the demon king so he had to be locked up here. The duke began to deny that his son would never do that and was only told, I don't care. Perry says, you really care about your son, but you didn't know that he misappropriated public money and sent hired killers. The duke can't believe these words, he calls the two creatures. As soon as Julian pulled out a dagger and dived at the duke with it, Perry noticed that the guy had drunk the same potion and asked him to be careful as she was worried and thinking about him. Julian went to his father and told him that he had absorbed the duke's energy. He would not mind if the duke was thrown somewhere in the forest, as he is now so weak that he is even weaker than humans, so he is not dangerous. Cardell ordered Chuck to let Leaf and Zerk go, and to strip Zerk of his title since his own powers had left him, and to spread the word in all the details of how the two planned to kill Julian. Julian asks his father if he can go on a trip. The father wants to know why his son is in such a hurry, to which he replies that he himself does not want to quickly pass the title of Demon King to Julian. In the end, the father agrees that Julian should go on a trip, and he will defend the castle in the meantime. Julian and Perry are waiting for Leon. Julian is not at all happy about this. He would like them to go without Leon. Henry tells Perry about his fears. He is worried that Julian is so obsessed with her. But Perry only says that he will meet his life partner on the way and lose interest in her. After this conversation, Henry gives the girl a scroll, 
as it can be very useful, given the fact that the girl does not have magic. With the help of a scroll, you can even escape if you are cornered. Leon approaches everyone. The girl is very unhappy that the guy is so late, so she decided to slap him. Julian got on the horse and now it was Perry's turn. She had never ridden a horse before. She decided that the horse would just ride for no reason, just sit on it. Julian realized that she did not know how to ride at all. He invited the girl to sit on the same horse behind him and asked her to hold on to him so that she wouldn't fall off, and he began to drive the horse. All three of them were heading to Delkaon. Leon reminds us that at this time the city is hosting a festival. As it is the season of azalea blooming, it is the right time to meet someone. This is exactly the place where you can find Juliana a faithful assistant and companion. Everything should go smoothly. They get to the city. Leon likes it here very much. He would be happy to meet some demoness. The girl asks Julian to watch Leon while she goes to buy food for them. The girl's attention was drawn to the kebabs and honey drink, and she decided to stand in line. She is approached by a demon standing behind her in line, offering to meet her and spend time in each other's company, to which the girl replies that she has a lord and is just buying food for him. Then Julian approached them with Leon in his arms. He said that the girl was his butler. The guy called Julian a rabble-rouser, which made Perry unable to restrain herself and broke his arm. Julian says that the girl broke only her arm for nothing, and that if she meets him again, she should break it for him, and even better if he finds out what family the demon is from. We shared a fragrant and delicious azalea drink with Leon. The girl was asked about sleeping over, but she had completely forgotten about it because she didn't need to sleep. So now Leon will have to go and arrange for a place to sleep. Julian drinks the drink, saying that it is tasty and fragrant. When asked why these flowers do not grow near the castle, he answers that perhaps the storage of these flowers is not as easy as it seems. Julian asks why the girl is not eating, and he hears the very expected answer that she is a doll. He brings the food right to her face and gives her a taste of what he bought especially for her, and then takes a bite himself. At some point, Perry felt that they were being watched. Everyone, regardless of age and gender, could not take their eyes off the adult Julian, while Perry saw him as a child. When suddenly the girl notices that something is wrong, Julian replies that he doesn't feel well. He is hot and itchy, his head hurts. The girl thinks that there could be poison in the food. He shouldn't have tried everything. She gave the boy some medicine for his headache and wanted to go to the pharmacy to get some more, when Julian stopped her and asked her to stay with him. Leon approaches them with the good news that he has found a place for them to live. But then he notices Julian and asks what is wrong with him. Perry says that the gentleman is not well, and perhaps it was something with food or drink, and learns from Leon that it was the drink. After all, the azalea drink is a kind of love potion. Leon did not tell about it before because there is no danger in the drink. Leon asks to go out and have fun. Since he has already done everything and they came to the campsite he found, Julian told him to leave and not to come back alive. The young gentleman asked the girl if she would always be there for him. She said always, and hugged him tightly. But the girl thinks that the boy will find a life partner on this journey, and after the third awakening, she will die by his hand. But the thought that Julian will be with another demoness makes Perry feel jealous. Her thoughts are interrupted by Julian, who asks her permission to kiss her. Henry tells the king that he probably shouldn't have taken these two together with Julian. He is too obsessed with Perry, or rather childhood memories, and Leon, not particularly sane, at that time, the king replies that Julian is no longer a child, and perhaps these feelings are not only obsession, as there is only one step between love and affection. He ordered to spread a rumor that the butler was a dragon, let it be rumored that one of the dragons lived in the world of demons, and he looked thoughtfully, wondering what his son would choose in the end. Julian kissed Perry very gently and romantically. It was a very long kiss. But then Julian started bleeding and even lost consciousness and woke up in bed next to Perry. Perry asked how the boy was feeling. He said he was fine and hugged the girl tightly. Perry left the embrace and headed for the door. She wanted Julian to sleep and rest. When Julian asked why she was so cold, she only said, It goes without saying I am not a living being, but an artificially created being. The girl found Leon, flirting with one of the girls at the festival. She slapped him and took him with her. On the way she still thinks about Juliana, she needs him, but he is not in her. What happened yesterday is just a side effect of the potion, and he will soon forget her. 
The girl got to Julian's team, opened the door, thinking that he was still sleeping, when she saw a guy without a t-shirt. It confused her a lot. She turned away and said that she had to go buy breakfast and let Julian get ready. The girl left the room, closed the door, but she doesn't understand what it was. Her heart almost stopped. The girl cooked a creamy stew with carrots for breakfast, but Leon didn't like it much. So Julian said that Perry tried, bought food, so let him eat. After which the conversation turned to the love potion, and it turned out that Julian knew about the properties of the drink. Leon looks at the two and asks what happened between them that night, to which they answer in completely different ways. Julian says that it did, and the girl denies it. Julian adds that it was impossible to forget. Everyone's attention is focused on a red-haired girl who has fallen to the ground and is being stopped, called a thief. Perry picked her up by the collar and started shouting to let her go, but a whole bunch of people had already gathered, calling her a thief and telling her not to let go. Perry just asked everyone to calm down. The boys started running up to those who called the girl a thief, wanting to protect their sister, and Perry threw the girl, but a boy with a baton approached her, threatening her not to touch his sister. Julian has used his magic to stop the whole mess, so now no one can move. The boy with green hair is still trying to resist, but he hears, Meal, enough! Demons grow up abruptly after awakening, so they have no concept of adolescence. But this boy looks less than 16 years old. Julian became jealous that the girl was looking at the boy like that, but she only offered to take the brave kid with them, to which Julian replied that he was weak. He hardly felt any demonic energy. The boy only says that he is not a demon, which makes Juliana very angry, and he says that he will kill everyone if he does not tell the truth about who he is. But he gets the answer that they are just people. Everyone was surprised by the people who were able to resist the demonic energy. If it was really a person, then Julian came even closer threatening the guy. He began to shout in fear that they were demons. As Julian suddenly kissed the guy and offered to date him, magic passed around him, and Leon confidently declared, a half-breed as I thought. Perry recalls that when she was still a human, there were many of them. In those days, nature was capricious, difficult to cultivate land, constant natural disasters, coupled with the pettiness of humanity, this would soon lead to extinction. So for their own survival, people decided to borrow strength and skills from other races through incest. The guy continues to claim that he is a demon, but Julian comes up and says that there are actually a lot of half-breeds here and asks Perry what they will do with them. Perry says that these children meant no harm, especially since when she was human, half-breeds were one of the few races that helped her. She adds that it's too crowded, and they need to leave. They don't want others to know about their identity. She asks Leon to calm down the crowd that is gathered here, and he has erased their memory, specifically these events. So now when they try to remember what happened, completely different thoughts and images will be in their heads. Leon teases Meal, calling him a half-breed, after which Meal learns that he is a demon of nightmares and was about to eat him. They enter the building, leaving Leon outside. Perry offers them both to become slaves of Mr. Julian. When the girl asks the butler what will happen if they do not agree, she answers, death, and says that what is the point of living at all if they are always in danger and can die not of their own free will? Perry was asked who she was, and she told them she was a doll, but then she felt something wrong with her body. No, her sensations are interrupted by the red-haired girl's answer, who agreed and told her brother that everything would be fine. The girl bowed and said her name, Rosina, after which Perry introduced herself, Leon and the demon king Julian, which shocked the two of them, because they did not expect him to be the son of the demon king. Perry said that children should obey three rules. The first is to always obey orders. The second is to tell only the truth, and the third is to accompany the young master, so they will become a great strength and support for Julian, because Perry will sooner or later return to the spirit world. The girl lets the two go to get their things, and to prevent them from running away, she calls her lights to watch them. But before they leave, she says that Meal will now live in her room, which makes Julian jealous. Julian said that the boy could live in her room, but then she should move in with him, because they have a special relationship and then Perry realized what it meant that Julian was too obsessed. Perry suggested that the young lord make a soul oath, and he was very excited, but then she explained that the oath was not with her, but with the half-breeds, so that they would be faithful and could not betray him. 
He said that the decision was definitely not a good one. Leon heard this and explained that only spouses, future husband and wife, make a soul vow. And apparently Julian wanted to keep the girl in this way. She asked, Are you crazy? To which Julian replied, Do I look crazy? And she decided to postpone this conversation for later, as there were too many ears to listen. The girl is thinking about how to send the children to the castle. She opened the scroll, which she was given, however, for other purposes. But now it does not matter. The scroll was directed at Rosina, after which a bright light appeared. Blinding the eyes, the girl disappeared. The girl does not trust these children, but in the future they will be needed. She turned to Meal and asked why they are here at all, and not in Middle-earth. But Leon answered her, telling her that now there is a complete mess there. The people of the Empire oppress and sometimes openly kill the half-breeds. So many of them moved to the world of demons before there were good relations between people and half-breeds. But now it is not so. Now people have taken everything from the half-breeds and started hunting them, and this affected not only the fairies. Now dwarves and elves have been drawn into this war. Dragons do not interfere, because no one has seen them for a long time, about 5,000 years. Perry thought that since no one had seen them for so long, it was a good thing that she had met Julian, because no one could kill her except him and the dragons. And if she had gone looking for a dragon, who knows how long it would have taken. Perry says it's time to watch the fireworks. She turns her attention to Meal and puts a special shape of a light to him, saying that if he doesn't betray them, nothing bad will happen. Perry and Leon went to their seat while Julian and Meal went to buy some food, but then they are called out, telling them to give it back, because Mrs. Jane liked it. They both pretend not to notice that this girl is attracting their attention again, saying that she is the daughter of Count Gork, so they had better give her a seat while she asks nicely. Perry replies that she doesn't really want to, which makes Mrs. Jane very angry. She assumes that the white-haired girl is a rich man's bedpan, and if not, she should know her place. And Perry only replies that if she means looks, she looks much prettier than her, although she is not bad either. This makes Mrs. Jane very angry, and she asks her servants to remove the two from her sight. One of Jane's servants took a swing at the girl, but received only a strong blow and fell exhausted to the floor. Mrs. Jane continues to threaten the girl, but then Julian comes up to them and chases her away while she is still alive. 